So we have um, so we have a few more speakers before we were going to have our full question and answer panel, but Professor Emmanuel uh, is going to have to leave, and we just thought that he's given such a you know interesting talk, uh, that, you know that's probably <laughs> provoked some thought, uh, and and maybe we should have an opportunity to query him a bit before he goes. So maybe we, we'll spend the next uh, ten minutes uh, taking questions with uh, Professor Emmanuel, and then we'll continue uh, you know the, the talks as planned. Any, any, anybody with any questions to start? Really, no? Either in agreement or shy or postprandial fatigue. Rob? Yeah. I would sort of challenge the notion that sort of using the rights of the health isn't useful. Um, coming from the, the UK, where, where uh, the right to health has almost become a religion. Um, in fact, you know, the, the, uh, the NHS has been called the closest thing that the British people have to religion. That we, it's, it's very much used, uh, the expectation that, that governments uh, ensure that you get the health services you need. And it's sort of woe betide any politician that undermines this. We're even sort of seeing this in, in, in the Brexit. Uh, farce at the moment that that um, the, the the argument is is that if if we leave the EU more money will be spent on the NHS. So it really is the case I find in the UK and I, and I'm sure it's the same in Thailand as well that sort of people are using this right to health to force the politicians to make sure that the health system is financed properly. And also maybe sort of suggest that here in the United <laughs> States where there isn't uh, such an explicit right to health, you know, that, that your health care expenditure is, is double um, the, that of the UK. So this notion that if you create a right to health expectation, it res results in higher costs isn't borne out by the evidence because here in the US, you're spending so much more. No, no, so I, I didn't, I don't think I said, that the right to health care gets you higher costs. What gets you higher costs in the United States and Switzerland, uh, two highest cost countries in the world, is no budget. There's no upper limit. What you have in England is a budget, uh, and that controls your costs. But famously, Britain uh, underspends given its GDP per person. Um, so your right to health is a little peculiar because, yes, people can demand a right to health, but as we know, um, the NHS is, uh, has been for 30 or 40 years, maybe even longer now, uh, 40 years, uh, pretty much starved. Uh, it's been underfunded uh, substantially. Um, and but the question is a universal entitlement to what is the fundamental question. That, that was, so my first point is that Entitlement, but the real question, the real work we need to do intellectually is a universal entitlement to what? That's what the universal health, that's what, which services do we cover? And which services are on that list? Um, and I think that in, certainly in low income countries, in the global health context, the big challenge is what is it, and I think uh, Ole put this right, what, what do you cover? That's the question, and I don't think saying I have a right answers that question at all. Saying, well, what's the purpose of healthcare? What is it supposed to achieve? You know, allow people to live a good life, live up to 75 years um, in pretty moderately good health. That is a m much co more coherent view of what you, the kind of services that you need to get to. That's what I would argue. Pick up Mary Jo and then Eric. I have a question that really bounces off of Dr. Mungunga's comment at the end of his talk, nothing about us without us. It seems to me that much of the discourse coming out of the Lancet and the professional work of bioethics is a lot of talk without us. And so, Ray's, Dr. Ray's presentation seemed like there was a lot of <laughs> us in her work. And I'm wondering how you conceptualize what you're formulating. Is it for the globe? And no, who so, gets a voice? So look, if, if the issue is what services do you provide to different health systems, or ought different health systems to provide, I think there's a multi-step process, but let me identify two that I think are really important. Um, uh, one is uh, you've got this set of, you might call core basket of uh, services um, that every country ought to uh, uh, cover. Um, and then you have a, sort of a set of discretionary services. You know, 
You can put them as uh, high priority, medium priority, low priority, however you want to uh, cut that pie. Um, and beyond the uh, sort of highest priority services, there is going to be discretion. And that's where you have to have uh, political processes to engage people and to make choices. Um, and I think, you know, one of the factors that we all hate is uh, having to choose among, ser well, we do, we having to choose among services. And because we know that certain services, a consequence of the choice. Some people will be, you know, we can put fancy lingo disadvantage. Some people are going to die. I mean, that's just the fact of it. And um, we don't like to do that. And there's a good reason we don't like to do that. It's very, very unpleasant. On the other hand, opportunity costs are what they are. And, you know, as well, I said, $32 is all Ethiopia has to spend. The government, I think, spends only 10 of it, 10 of the 32. Um, and so, you know, some choices are going to have to be made. You know, does human rights talk, does maximal attainable health care, social well-being help you in those decisions? I'm not sure. That That's my fundamental point. Eric, you had a question then? Uh, yeah, um, you had said that uh, in your talk that you thought that uh, the human rights uh, argument didn't really fund a lot of health care advances that we've came, come to today. It, it was more about disease-specific no, I didn't. I said primary care. I think I was saying primary care in that context. Oh, oh, okay. That the expansion of... Pri so if, if the Alma Alta Declaration said we ought to have primary care, that's the fundamental core of the health for all 20, 2000, I think it's very hard to argue in 2019, if you evaluate where we've been over the last 40 years, that it is, was primary care that has led to the substantial improvements we've had in global health. That was my argument. You're Not, saying that it was HIV and other things instead. I, if you, it, it's the disease-targeted interventions were the main drivers. Right, and my... my in that context that I said, primary health care has meant maternal health care. Right. Because well, I... I, I Oh, oh, my, Byron, I'm not 100 percent you you mentioned it in, in Indonesia. I can't speak to Indonesia as I as I said, but I think around the world that isn't what primary care means exclusively, at least in the African countries I've worked in. That's not what primary care necessarily means. With regard means. to HIV, though, um, you know, the primary rallying call of the HIV activist movement was a, a, was about human rights about the you know the right to health about the right to life uh the right to uh have access to like the the public safety net in in the US and and you know things like medicaid cards and food stamps and transportation allowances and housing the the whole social determinant uh basket as we now refer to it was being denied to people with aids because they didn't live long enough to get a disability uh, designation to qualify for those services and so you know we came forward with a with the cry that you know health the right to life the right to you know basic necessities like safe housing and, and food security was a right and and I think you know that that's a lot that resonated with uh, not only uh, you know celebrities and and the media and the public at large eventually but with governments and 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 governmental officials and got uh, you know Congress uh, to join us in in bringing forward like the Ryan White Care Act and the uh, housing Opportunities for People with AIDS Act and and the AIDS Drug Assistance Program. And so, uh, you know, I'm just... Uh, well, I, I mean, you and I can have an argument as to whether it was the human rights language or the development of effective interventions that could prolong life that made it untenable to deny people those services. Um, I, I'm not sure it's the rights language that uh, is what did that. On the medical side, what did that so work? Guys Let's do let's do three three interventions. We have one there, one there, one there, and in the opposite order. Sorry, so, so yeah, really short, like literally thirty second interventions. One, two, three. Thank you very much. Mine is very quick, simple. Um, in do you believe that Ethiopia that right now has thirty dollars per person available? Do you th think uh, with this? Um, uh, solidarity, do you believe they should be alone in that, bridging that gap, or you believe in a global solidarity? I'm no globalist, but I'm also not a nationalist hero, but I believe in no, a global no, solidarity. No, look, look, so, I, 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 why do we want Ethiopia 
to deal with the thirty-two dollars they have alone, and then we still call a discipline called the global health. And why? Is hey, wait, wait, wait! Thirty seconds. So, yes. thank you. I, I'm not a. Uh, I've decried the fact that uh, that global health funding has plateaued for the last decade. I think that's a real tragedy. It's one of the actual best buys out there for assistance in all sorts of ways, right? I am simply dealing with the reality, even if we open the floodgates, even if we double global health assistance, which we're, by the way, not going to do, even if we were to do it, you would still have this fundamental choice of what services does Ethiopia provide. It cannot provide the full basket of services. You know, Turkey, for example, spends $1,000 a person. We're not getting Ethiopia from 32 to 1,000. So we have this fundamental problem. No, we're not. We have this fundamental problem. It cost 0 0.18 of the high-income countries' GDP to Look, do that. I, I totally agree with you. I, I, I've published that. I agree with that, yeah. right? Okay, and we're still not going to do it. Why? Okay, one more. Not because you don't want to, but you're saying it's not going to be done. Uh, uh, politically, I, I've just been in the, those discussions. It's not going to happen. Professor Roy, you want to make an intervention? Yeah, sorry. I, I, I'm not going to try and argue with you. I just want to say that um, HIV, because of task shifting, is delivered in primary care. Uh, if you consider primary care as being um, health center level, even in the rural areas and in many African countries. So HIV is delivered through primary care. If they need hospitalization, it escalates, okay? TB is delivered in primary care. Um, and again, if it, if it uh, needs hospitalization, it escalates. So in a way, it's w primary care is the entry point um, and people may need, and certainly with, Preventing maternal deaths, it's hospitalization. But antenatal care, et cetera, happens in primary care. So, I mean, to me, I think we can spend too much time arguing about is primary health care the way it happened? Because we also have community care. Um, uh, to me, we have to have strengthening of the health system. I agree. Uh, yeah. That's what I said. No, that's what I'm saying. I'm not arguing with you about that. I'm just clarifying. But on the issue of HIV and um, the social determinants and access to healthcare, it was absolutely, sorry, I was there, okay? I was an HIV activist in the 90s, and it was absolutely the human rights agenda. And it was because of the activism of um, the gay community in South Africa that brought the prices down of antiretrovirals that our communities had access to it. Well, I, I would say that it, it's not clear to me for example, it done on a human it's rights not issue. clear to me that PEPFAR was a human rights, uh, justified as a human rights a, a intervention. This is not an intervention. Yeah, it is. It's clear. Oh, good. Uh, it's merely a, a point of information. I just looked it up. Um, the Swiss spend 11.1% of GDP on medical care. Uh, England spends 9.8%. Uh, both well within the advanced industrialized um, um, one or two standard deviations from the mean and higher than a number of other countries like Australia. It's hard to argue that the uh, national health has been starved by these standards. And of course, all of them are roughly half of the 20% that is spent in the United States. Look, that we overspend and that uh, developed countries have to spend somewhere between 10 and 12 percent, I think is uh, pretty well established, and you can get all the services on an efficiently run system. All I suggest is that Britain has done, you know, look, lots of people uh, have recommended that Britain increase by 1 percent its spending uh, on health, and that would solve a lot of its problems. Uh, overcrowding, the problems of shortages that they have, the dirty hospitals. <laughs> I, I, I just, I, uh, okay, it's not true. Uh, I mean, but, but, but you have had, you have had overcrowding because of bad flu seasons and things. All right, that's not true? Well, even Simon Stevens required more resources during the bad flu season. Okay. All right. <laughs> oh, one more question. <laughs> 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 
very short one. You sort of, you raised the question with the highest attainable standard, but then you arbitrarily said 70, 75, when life expectancy in most of the world is way below 70. So if you, if you believed what you said, that 70 or 75 is what we should be, then that is above highest attainable. Like in Africa, it's 60 is life expectancy or 62. So I feel like there's a miscommunication between you saying that the, that, that is aspirational. Yeah, there is, there is. I'm not happy with the current system at all. I'm very unhappy with the current system, and I have written extensively that we need, that popping up to get uh, additional services is uh, uh, something we ought to be doing. It's a, as I mentioned, a Best Buy. I'm just being realistic about what we will do, and if you look at the last 10 years of spending, you know, I think realism is in order, and part of what we need to do is spend that money wisely. You know, one of the things we, do in many of these poorest countries is misallocate resources. You know, I'm an on I know you want to get me off the stage. Divine intervention. Uh, yeah, I'm an oncologist, and a lot of these countries waste tons of money on the latest drug instead of, you know, focusing in on just a few very curable cancers that can be treated with generic drugs. I don't, I'm not accept, the current system isn't acceptable. What I'm suggesting is that given the limited resources we have. We need to make choices, and those choices have real health consequences, right? And that putting it in a human rights frame doesn't help us with the fundamental choices of what are our best services, right? That's not the only criteria. You know, what's the biggest health care buck for the, uh, or bang for the buck, right? But that is a very fundamental criteria that I don't think human rights helps me solve. And I want to solve that question because lives literally are at stake. And I can tell you in oncology, it's quite clear. Wasting money on, you know, call it uh, uh, Avastin is not a good buy for a developing country. And yet Roche se sells many hundreds of millions of dollars around the world, not in the developed world, of that drug. And so part of what I'm suggesting is that's the question we ought to have. And saying I have a human right to that drug it makes no sense. It's counterproductive to what we all want to achieve. That's what, I, I hope that's clear now. Um, I, I don't think 62 is an acceptable age. I said 75. But that's different than saying 100. It's different than saying 90. Very different. And, or different than saying 84, which is Japan. I don't think the highest attainable standard is necessarily where we want to aim. It does become a, a so, and we've seen this in the U.S., a, you know, black box that can just suck in, a black hole that sucks in all the resources you can possibly imagine. Well, I guess we're not going to say live long and prosper. We <laughs> <laughs> 75 is a long time. <laughs> thank you all so right, much, thank Professor Mayer. I appreciate it. Our own Karen Thornburg, who is professor of literature of um, East Asian languages and civilization. She was the director until this year of the Asia Center, chair of the Department of Comparative Lit. And we're going to hear about her work in East Asia and looking at issues of caring and health. that you're coming came to be part, part of this. Yeah. And this, this is an amazing book that is coming out soon, right? Yes, and it's already available for pre-order on Amazon for only $228. Oh my God. No, we're, we're getting the digital. Have a lot of pictures in it? No, it, I don't think it has any pictures. It's very long. It's 750 pages. But we're going to get a digital version and a paperback, so just stay tuned. All right. Okay. Okay, so, so thank you very, uh, very much, Mary Jo, and thank you to everyone here. As Mary Jo mentioned, I'm a scholar of East Asia, I'm a scholar of literature, a uh, cultural historian. I've worked on a variety of topics uh, in my career, everything from empire and colonialism, diaspora, uh, trauma, environment, environmental humanities, gender, and uh, more recently on the medical humanities, and in particular, uh, literature and, and medicine. 
So I was asked to speak today a bit about East Asia, which is, a, which is an area of the world that we really haven't touched on, except very briefly on China, and also bring in a bit of more of the humanities, uh, particularly uh, artistic expressions of some of the challenges uh, that, that we're facing. So the basic concept that I'm going to be uh, outlining here today is that East Asian nations, as most of you probably already know, have some of the best healthcare coverage uh, in the world, but they're facing new challenges. Non-communicable diseases of all types are on the rise. Uh, mental health concerns are on the rise as well. But one of the largest uh, challenges is our growing rates of dementia across East Asia as East Asian societies move from aging societies to aged societies to super aged societies. And these are challenges across a broad range, uh, financial challenges, challenges of personnel, you know, who's going to care for these individuals, both family, friends, but also professional caregivers, and frankly, challenges of health for family and friends who, who are caregivers uh, for the ill and aged often for many, many years. Um, so just briefly, uh, what do we mean by East Asia? So we're all on the same page. When scholars talk of East Asia, we usually mean China, with 1.4 billion people, largest population in the world, uh, Hong Kong and Macau. Sometimes they're discussed separately, but uh, they're, they are both uh, special administrative regions of China and so part of China. We also refer to Japan as part of East Asia, 128 million, South Korea with 51 million, Mongolia 3 million, North Korea 25 million, and Taiwan uh, 23 million people. So a total of more than 1.6 billion uh, people. We also sometimes speak of Vietnam as part of East Asia. Historically, it was part of the East Asian cultural sphere, but now is generally seen as part of Southeast Asia. So I'll be focusing on health and aging in the three largest areas by population in East Asia. So that's uh, China, Japan, and South Korea, uh, as well as Taiwan. And I'll be giving an example from Japan of literature that uh, has illuminated the challenges of dementia. Just want us all to keep in mind that dementia literature, so poetry, prose, uh, fiction, memoirs, patient memoirs, um, including patient memoirs, family memoirs, this is a huge body of writing that is often not brought into discussions of how to improve uh, dementia care, but it's a huge body of writing across East Asia, across North America, in Europe, and other parts of the world. So in general, in China, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, people are covered under national health insurance. This includes foreigners, too. Uh, the one group it does not include are uh, undocumented workers, and that was brought up earlier today as a problem in other societies as well. Uh, quality of care is generally pretty good, uh, but it can vary uh, considerably, especially in China. So in China, about 95% of Chinese have basic health insurance coverage, uh, but this tends not to be comprehensive. It also can be uh, quite expensive. And the government is aware that this is a problem. They're actively working to cut health care costs and make basic care affordable to all residents within the next decade. The government has been working on major health care reforms since the turn of the 21st century, and we do see some improvements. Uh, but there's a huge contrast between public hospitals and private hospitals, no surprise. Um, and also in uh, the urban-rural divide is quite distinct. So if you're in an urban area, you can generally get very good care at some of the larger international hospitals. But if you're in a rural area, no matter how much money you have, you really can't get much good care at all. There's also a real shortage of doctors and, and nurses in China. Japan uh, offers universal coverage with the exception, again, of undocumented immigrants and short-term visitors. Uh, they have both employment-based insurance and the national health insurance system. It's a free access system, uh, enabling people to go to doctors and hospitals of their choice. This can cause backlogs, but it actually tends to work well. And I've lived in Japan for some time and have experienced this, that the lines actually aren't that long, even to see you know, some of the, the most highly esteemed uh, specialists. So it works, it works pretty well. The fees are set by the government. They're scaled according to your salary. Works pretty well, but again, there's the undocumented uh, worker uh, problem, uh, and that these individuals are not covered by health care and uh, health insurance, and so don't uh, have access to the same facilities that Japanese or longer-term visitors who are there on visas uh, have. In South Korea, health care is free to all citizens. Uh, national health insurance covers 97% of the population. Uh, this includes foreign nationals, and I experienced this too when I lived in Korea, have the same access to, uh, to universal health care, and the facilities tend to be excellent. 
Um, in Taiwan, it's also a national health insurance system. It's been there since 1995. It overall works quite well. Uh, services are pretty accessible. Uh, the specialists tend to be accessible. They're low wait, time, uh, low wait times, uh, low cost. Uh, and health insurance covers Western medicine, Chinese medicine, preventive service, elderly home care, a broad range of uh, services. But what does this all mean for care? So we've ta emphasized here, you know, the coverage is there, but what about care, and particularly care beyond um, acute uh, diseases or beyond uh, communicable diseases? Um, I guess I'd say that excellent coverage does not translate necessarily into excellent care, uh, particularly for um, individuals with diseases that are highly stigmatized, particularly uh, for the aged and those uh, with dementia and their, and their families. Uh, as I mentioned, the care of elderly persons with dementia is becoming a huge concern uh, across East Asia given the, the rising rates uh, of dementia. Uh, because um, across East Asia, these societies, at least the ones we're focusing on today, are moving, as I mentioned, into uh, super aged societies. China is the youngest um, of the bunch, but it's estimated that by 2030, 16.2% of the population will be over age 65, which makes it an aged society, according to the WHO. Uh, Japan's uh, Yomiuri Shinbun, which is one of their major newspapers, reported just last month that uh, Japan has um, the world's largest percent of its population that's over the age of 65. This is 28.4%. Um, those over age 65 are expected to account for 30% of the total population in 2025 and 35.3% in, in 2040. In South Korea, it's estimated that by 2030, 23.4% of the population will be over 65, and Taiwan's population is, is showing similar, similar trends. Of course, East Asia is not alone in this, but this is where uh, much of my research is done. And as is well known, one of the greatest healthcare challenges uh, for aging, aged, and super aged societies is uh, dementia, ca dementia care, particularly considering that dementia rates are rising. We've seen that across, across East Asia. Even though China is the youngest of the societies that we're, that we're discussing in these few minutes here, it has the world's largest population of people uh, with dementia, just because China's population is so much bigger. Um, the population of, of people with dementia was 3.5 million in 1990, 5.1 million in 2000, uh, four, it's about 14 million now, and estimated that it's going to jump to over 23 million uh, by 2030. This has attracted a lot of headlines uh, globally. Um, in, in some newspapers, it's called, uh, you know, China China's facing this tidal wave of dementia, China's running out of time. Uh, others have said dementia in China uh, presents one of Earth's largest and costliest uh, public health crises, a slow-moving calamity of human suffering that also pretends economic and political danger. The very wealthy in China can generally get, uh, get very good care. And I've, you know, some friends and, and have seen this, and the, the care is, is equal to, to anything um, one, one could expect globally. But the vast, vast majority of uh, in families who have a family member with dementia don't receive anywhere near uh, this, this type of care. Um, part of the problem is that dementia, in, for most physicians in China, is still seen as a normal part of aging. It's not seen as a particular um, disease or as something that needs uh, special attention. There are tremendous stigmas attached to words for uh, dementia. And so people are very hesitant, even if they have been diagnosed, which is rare, um, but not so rare that China doesn't, you know, we know China has the largest population of individuals with dementia. But families will often go to great lengths to hide the fact that their, you know, grandmother, grandfather, or parent, or sibling, or spouse uh, has dementia. And of course, we all know what happens when diseases are stigmatized like this. People can't get good care, and family members who are doing this very uh, heavy-duty lifting uh, for years uh, can't get care. Um, can't get care either. And the Chinese government has actively blocked uh, dementia NGOs. It's part of the real denial uh, that the Chinese government has had to various health conditions over the years. I mean, HIV/AIDS is a is a big example. SARS is another example. Uh, Japan now has 4.6 million individuals with dementia, the total expected to shoot up to about 7.3 million, or one, of five, one in five Japanese over the age of 65 uh, by 2025. 
and there's similar proportions uh, for South Korea and, and Taiwan. Now, it's not all bad news. There have been some initiatives uh, to make a life a bit easier uh, for both individuals with dementia and their families. Uh, there has been some recognition in various parts of East Asia, very, various communities, and concerned individuals that uh, caregivers are a huge and rapidly growing part of the population uh, that needs help. I'll just give a few examples here. In Japan, they're gradually moving away uh, from the medicine-based institutional approach uh, to care that, uh, that has been in practice to care that incorporates the entire community. In 2012, the Japanese Ministry of Health um, introduced Japan's Orange Plan. I'm not quite sure why they call it the Orange Plan, but I'm sure there's a good reason. Uh, and they decided, you know, we're going to tackle dementia not through the individual physician, uh, and the patient, maybe the patient's family, but we're going to think about the community as a whole, the neighborhood um, as a whole. So um, enabling neighborhood volunteers to do home visits, supporting family caregivers, educating school children, uh, things like that. Um, certain communities, even you know, in the ur urban areas, um, rural areas as well, they've created drop-in centers for families uh, whose, whose loved ones are suffering from dementia. Um, some enterprising individuals have uh, thought to develop QR codes that can be ironed into clothing and then identify uh, individuals who, with dementia who've wandered off. And this is actually a huge problem in Japan as a lot of elderly live alone. And uh, then it's, it's very difficult uh, to keep track uh, of them because there's no one you know, looking out for them. And about an annually, about 15,000 elderly Japanese go missing. So this is a big problem, and, and um, various communities are thinking of, of ways to uh, better uh, grapple with this. Um, the Japanese government also adopted, several years after the Orange Plan, the so-called New Orange Plan, to, they, to, quote, prioritize the perspectives of people with dementia and their families. So not doing as much of the top-down approach as had been done before, but again, really integrating uh, care uh, from, or, or paying much more attention to what individual families need, individual patients need, and individual um, communities, <laughs> communities need. Um, they've, as part of this new orange plan, they've set up, you know, Alzheimer's cafes where people with dementia and their families can meet and share uh, information. These are generally organized by community care centers. It tends not to be, again, a top-down national um, initiative. Um, they built dementia villages. We see those, of course, in Europe and certain part of the United States. So a lot of different uh, attempts over the years to provide better support and care uh, for individuals with dementia and their families. Similar things have been going on in Taiwan. Uh, the Taiwanese Alzheimer's Association has worked for many years to create what they call a dementia-friendly society across Taiwan, which involves educating school children, police, uh, shop owners, who can make special arrangements with families who have uh, loved ones with dementia, You know, special hours where they can come in and do shopping in a very low stress, uh, welcoming um, environment. Uh, they've created all kinds of different initiatives, uh, the Elderly with Dementia Guardian Angel Project, which pairs members of the public with individuals uh, with dementia. There are a lot of examples of this, and you know, if you if you live in Taiwan, as I did, and you get to know people, you start and you you know read community bulletin boards. Um, and you know various internet chat groups and things like that, you see this kind of stuff going on. But these initiatives, however well-meaning, um, are mere band-aids. I mean, let's just let's just be candid about it. The levels of desperation remain uh, disturbingly high, and I'll just give uh, one example here of uh, what this what this desperation has led to. There was a court case, highly publicized court case, in June of 2017. Uh, in Osaka, which is the second largest city in Japan, where um, on trial was an 82-year-old woman, Otsuki Michiko, uh, who had strangled her husband uh, to death. He, he was 85 and had, had been suffering from dementia for, for many, many years. And the presiding judge gave her a suspended sentence, much to the surprise of, of everyone, because she was, she was clearly guilty of strangling him to death. And he said in his judgment, quote, it cannot be said that the burden of nursing care was not heavy. The fact that she committed the crimes after being cornered psychologically deserves our sympathy. 
Uh, Otsuki had attempted suicide after uh, murdering her husband, but she hadn't been able to follow through with it. Her son called the police and, and they arrested her. This is not the only example of uh, desperation. Uh, there are a lot of them, and part, part of this is because that despite these little Band-Aid approaches, which are incredibly well-meaning, uh, they only cover small a very small percent uh, of the population, and it takes a community that's really fully engaged in um, helping individuals with dementia and their families, and the number of individuals who are really fully engaged in that is, is very, very um, small, because stigmas against the disease persist. Stigmas against men who want to serve as caregivers. There was a mayor of a, a large Japanese city whose mother uh, developed dementia, and he took time off uh, from his official duties to care for her and even wrote a memoir about his experiences. And he was harshly criticized in the press because that's not what men do, right? Care is women's work, and how dare he uh, take time away to care for his mother. When there's stigmas like that uh, going around, you know, people aren't even inclined to uh, provide the care that, that they might want to and be able to. So on my final minutes here, as I mentioned, I'm a scholar of cultural history, a scholar of literature, and I have this big new book, overly expensive, but hopefully soon reduced in price coming out, that, that looks at uh, literature from around the world that grapples with questions of improving care and healing and strengthening advocacy. Um, and I think, you know, looking when we're having conversations about improving health, improving healing, improving well-being, I think literature is something to look at. It's not the only thing to look at, of course, but it is something to look at because it tends to offer unique or at least very distinctive perspectives of individual and family experience and individual and family suffering. And I've, you know, we've, I guess we've only been here one day, but I really haven't noticed much um, in the way of talking about individual experiences. And I think it's really important, um, of course, everyone in this room is familiar with these issues, but a lot of people in society aren't. And literature is, it's not an easy way to get into this, but it is a pathway into understanding why these issues really, really matter for society, for individuals, and kind of for every, every layer in between. And um, as, I, as I mentioned, there's a huge corpus of literature on Alzheimer's, of literature on dementia. Most of it is written by uh, physicians, okay, I'll wrap up really quickly, uh, written by uh, physicians, caregivers, some of it, and more of it is written by um, patients themselves in, in various forms. And I just wanted to introduce to you today uh, one novel from Japan, Mizumori Minai's Inheritance from Mother, a newspaper novel published in 2012. Um, in my book, I put this in conversation with a book written in the 1970s um, titled, um, what is it, uh, Kokotsu no Hito, or, or Person with Dementia, published by Ariyoshi Sawako. It's shocking, actually, how similar these novels are. They both describe the caregiver's experience, and they show how little has changed in Japan in the last 40 years in offering caregivers support. And I don't have much time, but make a long story. And it's a thick novel, long story, very short. It's about two sisters uh, whose father died uh, some years earlier. He didn't have um, adequate health insurance. This was before Japan had a good health insurance system and suffered quite a bit at his death. Um, but right now, they're grappling with their aging mother who has dementia. And they're pretty well off. They own land. They have access to all the best facilities. Uh, but they also have their own issues. You know, one of the sister has chronic health problems, uveitis. Uh, another sister's in a really dysfunctional, abusive marriage. And this, this novel shows the difficulties they have in getting physicians to listen to their wishes and respecting their mother's right to die. This is a huge part um, of the novel. And it shows the family's vulnerability. Like, so even the families who are most privileged, their tremendous vulnerability and the fact that they, are, they too are not being provided uh, with the support that they need. And just finally, this novel is based on Mizumura's own experiences caring for her mother with dementia. And she wrote an article in the New York Times titled, Please Mother Enough. This was 2014, so two years after the book was published. And she talks about sitting at her mother, dying mother's, her beloved dying mother's bedside, and just wishing her mother would die and saying, you know, mother, when are you ever going to die? And then catching herself and like, oh my God, I can't say that. I love my, my mother. How can I say that? 
But after sitting there, you know, week after week, month after month, year after year, not having support, not having anyone to, to care for her, that's how desperate she was. And she talks in this article and in other articles about the reader responses that she got to this novel and how many people told her, you know, you've saved me. I'm now able to forgive myself for thinking these horrible thoughts. And, you know, they read this novel and like, oh my gosh, I'm not alone. And, you know, Mizumura hadn't realized it was going to have that effect. But, you know, through her novel, through her essays and other writings, she's showing the desperation of family caregivers in Japan. You know, even those who are very privileged and have access to all kinds of resources, there just aren't the resources um, that, that they need. So, you know, in these, these Asian countries, we talk about universal health care. It's taken as a given. You know, foreigners like myself go there and, and can access excellent medical care. But as, as I think is quite obvious, you know, health care for all doesn't really, that's no guarantee of either health uh, or of care for, for quite a few. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Willen, who is a professor at, of Anthropology at UConn and Director of the Research Program on Global Health and Human Rights at the UConn Human Rights Institute. And we've written some books together. And she this morning she gave us a wonderful talk on fighting for dignity migrant lives at Israel's mar margins, her new book. And Sarah has a project called Arches, which is American conceptions of health equity studies. So she'll discuss the health equity issues and what she's finding in her current research. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Mary Jo, and thank you for the opportunity to share a few thoughts. Um, I'm actually a little glad to hear that your book is more expensive than mine. Mine's only $90, so <laughs> academic publishing. So what I'd like to share today are some ethnographic reflections. And I'm coming, I'm glad to, to follow um, Professor Thornburg, who's, who's come at today's issues from a slightly oblique angle. I'll, I'll come at them from another oblique angle, angle and reflect on um, three, uh, what I would like to think of as idioms of social justice mobilization for health. So let me, let me go ahead and lay out my thinking. So the, our principal aim, the principal aim of this conference, according to our organizers, and in light of the 40th anniversary of Alma Ata, is to reflect, and I quote, on efforts to guarantee access to health care as a universal right of citizenship and common humanity. And many, but as we know well, not all, health researchers and public health professionals and activists and representatives of health philanthropies would likely identify with those efforts, um, in most cases, maybe many cases, maybe most, I don't know, um, with great enthusiasm. Um, but we know full well that in the United States today, and I think this is probably clearer to us now than when we woke up this morning, um, this claim and its anchoring premises are not universally supported um, by the broader public or even among those shaping the way we think as a nation about healthcare and distribution of health resources. To, to the contrary, in today's polarized environment, so support for policies edging toward universal health coverage or something like it um, would appear to have eroded considerably. Um, or at least the landscape of support has become difficult to use as a, a basis for political strategizing in this pre-primary political moment. So in my presentation, I want to train my gaze on the US, um, but not with a focus on domestic efforts to advance UHC. Um, instead, drawing on insight from medical anthropology and public health ethics, I'd like to reflect on some of the ways in which arguments about health and justice are framed and advanced, and how such messages land or fail to land with their intended audiences. Put differently, I'm interested in the travel and transit of what we can characterize as parallel and sometimes competing idioms of social justice mobilization for health. And I'd like to consider three today, health and human rights, health equity, which we could put in quotes since it travels as, a, as a, an idea, um, particularly in the United States, and more tentatively, solidarity, and uh, pay a special attention to their reception in the United States. And I'll draw on findings from two separate ethnographic studies uh, to discuss how certain frameworks for thinking about health and justice that hold sway in some settings, um, in some scholarly conversations, in some world regions, 
um, have just gained limited traction here in the United States. Um, so put simply, I'm asking, you know, why might certain conceptions of health and justice that travel well elsewhere fare poorly here? And how might ethnographic exploration of these questions and idioms help promote health and justice in the US or even more broadly? And I want to make clear um, that I'm drawing on some work of my own and some collaborative work with a couple of colleagues here in the room, Michael Knippa and uh, Cesar Aladie Barrero. Um, so let me just lay out a little bit of a definition. Um, in speaking about idioms of social justice mobilization for health, I, I use this to think about f different frameworks for thinking about the relationship between health and justice or injustice. And this term idiom evokes a language, right? A mutually accessible way of organizing thought and consolidating interest and commitment. Here's another formulation that we developed together. We could think of idioms of social justice mobilization for health as um, concrete strategies for melding scholarly insight and ethical values with the goal of promoting social justice in the health domain. And as we argue in a recent Lancet piece, different idioms are grounded in different traditions of scholarship and practice, and they reflect their parent fields, principles, and priorities, and goals. And across this variation, um, we propose that idioms of social justice mobilization for health share five common principles. And this is in the Lancet piece, if you're interested. Um, and this is sort of the, the bread and butter of our, our com conversation, um, a recognition that upstream factors can cause grave harm to the health of individuals and populations, a recognition of differential vulnerability, um, an emphasis on prioritizing vulnerable, the vulnerable, um, a recognition that health inequities can best and perhaps only be remediated through upstream intervention, um, and a recognition that sustainable reduction in health inequities will require collaboration across sectors and, uh, and professions. So we might want to think of descriptive, scholarly, and action-oriented idioms, kind of breaking things down um, in this way, but of course there's a lot of overlap, and so what I'm about to show you is much more tangled than this uh, tripartite uh, model would suggest. Um, so, you know, we could think about using different idioms descriptively and think about the history of language and how these terms have come into fashion and fallen out of fashion, um, dispar health disparities, inequalities, or health inequities. We could think in terms of kind of action-oriented idioms like human rights, humanitarianism, liberation theology. We might put global health in this category. We might put health equity in this category. And here we could sort of pull out a separate set of kind of branded idioms, primary health care, health and all policies, um, it's WHO, Healthy People 2020, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's culture of health model, uh, which I'll return to. Um, or we might think in terms of scholarly idioms, social medicine, social epidemiology, and others. And as you can see, it's, it's a really messy classification, but it's kind of helpful to, to get us thinking, I think. Um, so these different idioms of social justice mobilization, I would suggest, are more than just buzzwords. Um, each takes a different tack in trying to debunk claims that health disparities are somehow natural or beyond the scope of human intervention. And each strives to catalyze a different form of action. Although different idioms stand in variable relation to one another, they're often invoked together, including at times with competing idioms, with very different genealogies that espouse different core principles and advance different strategic aims. And um, I won't walk through this, and I know it's very small, but this is sort of one way in which we've tried to plot out some of these differences, if anyone's interested in looking a little more deeply. So, Arguably, uh, one of the aims of our gathering here is to consider the strengths and limitations of universe, universal health coverage itself as an idiom of social justice mobilization for health, to examine the conditions of its emergence, to reflect on its core principles and aims, to assess its merits in relation to other parallel and competing idioms, and to speculate about its chances of achieve, achieving its declared objectives. So in the time available, I want to draw on these two different ethnographic studies that I've been conducting to consider the strength and limitations of three contemporary idioms of social justice mobilization for health in the United States. Um, so let me start with health and human rights. And I want to take you to a really interesting exhibition uh, in 2014 at the CDC's museum in Atlanta. So I don't know 
I was surprised to learn that the CDC, CDC has a museum, a sensor museum, um, at its main campus in Atlanta. And in 2014, it had an exhibition called Health is a Human Right, Race and Place in America. Did anyone happen to catch the exhibition? No, about 50,000 people did. So I'm a little surprised that no one here managed to, to pay a visit. But um, when I learned that there was an exhibition at CDC's museum called Health, Health is a Human Right, my ethnographic antennae went up, and I pretty much hopped a plane as soon as I could. Um, so uh, this exhibition was uh, created in recognition of the 25th anniversary of the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. And it chronicled the enduring impact, the enduring health impact, of over a century of discriminatory laws, policies, and practices in the United States. But of course, the title is surprising. Um, you know, almost 170 countries have ratified the you know, Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, not the United States. Um, we don't have a right to health in the US Constitution or in um, you know, federal law. And instead, successive administrations have avoided establishing obligations, domestic or global, in the realm of economic, social, and cultural rights. Um, so I won't go through the, the research methods that I've used, but you know, I spent a lot of time in the exhibition itself. I talked to the people who created it and conceived of it. Um, I talked to some university faculty who were teaching it and sending their students. And I looked pretty deeply at the materials themselves, the images and uh, the accompanying text. And then I have a fascinating transcript of a, tra uh, a conversation among CDC staff about the exhibition. It was a big fight that broke out about whether there should be an exhibition with this title at CDC and whether in the US, we should be talking about health as a human right. So that is interesting, too. And I've written about this in a piece that just came out in Health and Human Rights Journal. So if you want to take a look and see some of the images, that would be a place to look. So I want to just offer a couple of questions or emerging insights. Um, you know, first, there's this question of how an exhibition with this frame and title and venue can be reconciled with the lack of any firm right to health commitment here in the United States. Um, and um, just to sort of give a quick answer to the question of why this title, um, you know, the, the short answer is that it really can't and that it's kind of a fluky thing that the title made it through <laughs> processes of review. Um, the exhibition itself went through intensive review and the title was The Curator's Innovation and it somehow made it onto this really striking um, slide. This is, you know, if a person were standing, they'd come up to about here. So it's a very large poster. Um, uh, and uh, this, this was the name of an exhibition that went for about eight months um, in Atlanta. There were, like I said, about 50,000 visitors. Um, and when I asked the director of the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity, and she was part, you know, she gave me access and was really part of the conversation that produced this piece of scholarship, which I thought was quite interesting in itself. Um, you know, she said the exhibition went through all of the reviews and clearances. It's nothing that anyone expected to see at CDC. And even so, people were happy about it. And we talked more about how not, not everyone was universally happy about it. But what I think it shows is that despite the title's lack of legal grounding, and despite some clear differences among CDC staff, the exhibition's architects reported a strong, intuitive sense of congruence between the title and their aims to educate and to inspire. And in fact, you know, the title's insistence that health is a human right shows how this claim can function as an idiom of social justice mobilization alongside, if in tension with other idioms, uh, such as health equity and social determinants. And perhaps the strongest evidence of this interpretation lies in a 2013 conversation between the curator and Sir Michael Marmot, who paid a visit um, and who you know, as, as um, Audrey has written in some of her important work, has avoided framing his own goals in human rights terms. And the curator recounted his, this conversation, delighting in his positive feedback. And he said, you talk about human rights, and then you don't bring it up again. She remembered him saying, and he continued, I would have done the same thing. <laughs> so I think that's quite interesting. You know, we, well, I'll, I'll just sort of leave things right there. Um, and then I want to turn quickly to two other idioms that travel in interesting ways um, in the United States. Uh, health equity. So I'm going to talk, and these images are probably familiar to many, if not most. Certainly, um, I would expect to the Americans, they're probably especially familiar. Um, we saw a version of one of them a little bit earlier, a version I hadn't seen. Um, so 
The project that, that Mary Jo mentioned that I've been involved with for the past few years is funded by the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation, and we call it the Americans' Conceptions of Health Equity Study. Um, and what we've, what we're, one of the things we're doing in this project comes from the recognition that in contrast to human rights or the right to health, this notion of health equity has gotten a good deal more traction in the United States. And in fact, it's fast become a powerful frame for public health research, policy making, and practice in the United States. It's deeply embedded in the work of the American Public Health Association and at you know, all levels of, of health governance um, in, in civil society and health philanthropy as well as <laughs> academic research. So we might think that this rapid uptake suggests some kind of broad consensus about the meaning of the term and significance, but this assumption is largely untested, and in fact, I think after today's deliberations, it's even messier than, than I was sort of thinking um, that it is. And so just to tell you very quickly about the project, our first phase is in Northeast Ohio. This is a map of um, uh, showing the gap in life expectancy of 12 years between um, the, an urban community in, in downtown Cleveland and um, a suburban area. And this is also my life story. This is where my grandparents were born. This is where I grew up. Um, so that's why Cleveland. Um, but um, to tell you just a little bit about the project and our research methods, it launched from a recognition or an, uh, an introduction to a health equity initiative or a health and equity initiative in Northeast Ohio called Health Improvement Partnership Cuyahoga that's trying to frame a conversation around health disparities and health inequities in the region. So it involves the county health department, the city health department, hospitals, medical schools, community-based organizations. Um, and, um, and we decided initially that we were going to just basically do a little ethnography of this initiative. And that's how the project started. Um, and then we had the opportunity to build something bigger <laughs> when we were invited by Robert Wood Johnson to, to develop a project. So we decided um, to uh, interview, we've conducted 170 qualitative interviews with a wide range of stakeholders in Cleveland, Ohio, um, and we're using what we're finding in those semi-structured interviews to develop a survey in our second phase, and that's sort of where we are right now. Just this is a, a quick overview. This is not an updated, we've reached our 170, but you know, we've talked to folks um, ranging from you know, government officials to um, community members who may be homeless or um, you know, have precarious life circumstances and, and a lot of different folks as well. So um, I won't walk through the different things we've asked about, but one in particular that's I think of interest is that we've tried to get a sense of whether the idea of health equity resonates, is meaningful, speaks to people. And we've shown this image and asked, have you ever seen anything like this? How would you explain what's going on in this image? And do you think it helps clarify this distinction that we often talk about between equality and equity? Mm -hmm. um, and what we're finding is, um, is interesting, and you know, just on one foot, we're finding that this distinction may not be especially well understood even among health professionals. I think that's worthy of note, and we'll have some, some um, stuff to say about that pretty soon. Um, it also may not travel well beyond the domains of health research and, and public health practice. So from a public standpoint, a lot of people don't really know what this is trying to say or what it means. Um, it's not doing enough translational work, I think. Um, and I think most problematically, um, the notion of health equity may operate euphemistically to signal conversations about injustice, but without catalyzing substantive reflection on the forms of redistribution that would actually be needed to move the needle toward a more equitable distribution of resources, um, either at the individual or the population level. And I think in this respect, uh, Professor Allen's talk adds some, some useful food for thought. So very briefly, um, this is the most tentative piece of, of um, what I have to offer, and it really, you know, we, we've been thinking with Robert Wood Johnson's culture of health model in this project. It's what supported our work. Um, this is the framework that's driving the, the funding of this very large health philanthropy that has a, a, a very significant role in U.S. health policy and thinking about health uh, in the United States. And at the root, the culture of health model makes the argument that advancing their aims, building a culture of health in the U.S., will depend on catalyzing a social movement rooted in the recognition that everyone's health is interdependent and that we're all in this together. And you know, so you could say, this isn't their language, but you could say that really what they're arguing is that 
we need a strengthened sense of solidarity in the United States, at least in relation to health and its social determinants, in order to, to really achieve meaningful change in, in terms of remediating health disparities or health, health inequities. And given the current atmosphere of polarization in this country, this would seem to be a tall order indeed. Now, I'm bringing in the language of solidarity in particular because it's an interesting area of, of engagement among bioethicists. Um, and um, you know, the contours of that conversation, the content of the concept still remain fuzzy. I think it's still being worked out and uh, contested. Um, but one leading definition of solidarity points towards shared practices reflecting a collective commitment to carry costs, uh, financial, social, emotional, or otherwise. And this is Pransak and Bui. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and so one of the things that we're doing in the ARCHES study is, is trying to get a sense of the degree to which the folks we've interviewed um, see them, their health as interdependent with others. Um, and the degree to which people are or might be willing to share the burden of cost for the health of others, including and especially members of social groups uh, from whom they regard themselves as substantively different in terms of race, ethnicity, or socioeconomic status, health-related lifestyle choices, um, or things like, of that nature. So the analysis of that material is underway, but there are a couple of questions that have already emerged as demanding further reflection. Um, you know, what leads Americans to feel a sense of solidarity with others in relation to health? Um, and what might precipitate the inverse? How might solidarity in the health domain be conceptualized or promoted or deepened? Um, you know, what would it take to catalyze that movement? Um, under what circumstances might that be possible? Um, what kind of project would that be and who would need to lead it? And finally, how might ethnographic insights help sharpen and advance conversation around these themes? So just to wrap up, um, you know, that I want to work through my title just a little bit and ask, you know, why have some of these idioms failed to land in the United States? Um, you know, we, we see that um, there are similarities and differences in interrelationships among many of them. Um, and, uh, you know, they don't tend to stand alone. They often travel together, at times complementing uh, each other or clarifying one another, and at other times in clear tension. So, you know, we can ask ourselves, well, is the problem, is it that the uh, friable concepts, right? Is that the problem that the concepts themselves are um, deficient? Is there a problem of imagination? Um, you know, there are at least two ways in which we may see a kind of imaginative failure. Are these robust idioms landing on inhospitable terrain, uh, you know, th that arise in one scholarly or sociopolitical or sociocultural um, environment but fail to take root in a new and different context? Um, or are these robust idioms that are accessible and legible and palatable only if you translate them well, only if you sort of do the interpretive work of, of making them accessible to the people you're trying to communicate with? And I think here ethnography might have an interesting role to play, and I'm thinking back to Professor Allen's a reflection on the kind of insularity of a certain kind of discourse and conversation around um, global health injustice that leaves out people who aren't uh, induct you know who aren't haven't been in, uh, inducted into the, the conversation. So just in closing, I offer as a little bit of a provocation, you know, might attention to universal health coverage as an idiom of social justice mobilization help clarify or confront or resolve obstacles to its success? And might this conceptual frame help set the stage for our next panel tomorrow, looking at universal health coverage in contrast to universal health care? So thank you. Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce Sarah, and then read Sarah. <laughs> um, where, where is Sarah lo located, actually? So she's the uh, research director uh, at the Center for Economic Social Rights, and is um, this organization is one of the first to challenge economic economic uh, injustice and the violation of human rights. She's worked in Iraq, Haiti, Ecuador, Texas, Mexico border, and Pakistan. So. I'm just going to spend two or three minutes, um, please interrupt me, um, summarizing her comments. She asks, 
do we need a human rights framework or the idiom of human rights to achieve social justice? What is the role of human agency given the medicalization of the health sector? She raises a question for Zeke Emanuel and notes that his paper mentioned investment in health increased because of HIV AIDS and not human rights. She argues, but from the beginning of the epidemic, activists have demanded that human rights are essential aspect of the HIV AIDS program. They have successfully demanded greater participation in the design and implementation of interventions to be informed and to make informed decisions about their health. The success of the HIV programming is a result of ground up empowerment and mobilization, a rights based framework and its enforcement at the national level. And so she goes on and really emphasizes this ground up um, aspect of um, how she perceives what is going on in, um, in challenging uh, the language that is used for universal health coverage. She refers to Audrey Chapman and Ole uh, Norham's um, papers, noting uh, the model, their human rights approach as the best model for achieving a pro-poor orientation and a pathway to universal health coverage. And she notes how along the accesses of out-of-pocket expenses and services, choices along those accesses may require a rights-based lens that include people as partners in decision making. She goes on asking who is going to make determinations about what is in health, um, you know, in, in the healthcare system? Who will set priorities for health services and inclusion of vulnerable populations? Who will set pricing out of po pocket expenses? How will the issues of hidden epidemics such as mental health be prioritized? What Will it even be on the agenda, given the lack of data and the stigma attached and the lack of qualified health professionals in many countries? What about other broader policy issues regarding coverage for non-nationals and migrants? What about the groups that are criminalized because of legislation such as sex workers, homosexuals, or drug users? Um, she then refers to her own research on access to HIV and other health services for sex workers and transgender people. She goes on to say that even when adequately funded, HIV services are available. The fear of stigma and discrimination is a major barrier, closely followed by violations of privacy and confidentiality. And while the Global Fund grants emphasize health system strengthening, limited funds are allocated for proper retraining of work, work staff on attitudes and behaviors. Those accessing health services face other barriers related to costs, including transport, hiring caregiver, loss of income. How will universal health coverage framework um, manage those barriers? Then goes on to ask, address the second question on the role of agency and in med medical care. And she compares HIV and tuberculosis and notes that the HIV community was successful in confronting programmatic norms and used human rights based approaches to organize and demand changes in policy and programmatic practices. Um, then she noted how even marginally in socially excluded, excluded uh, communities such as sex workers, et cetera, have been empowered in some cases uh, and able to um, be mainstreamed with healthcare systems. And she contrasts that, interestingly, to uh, the biomedical public health oriented ways of lab labeling TB patients, TB suspects, TB defaulters, TB index cases. The D TB community is now organizing and pushing for patient-centered approach rooted in rights-based language, claiming the dignity of the person. She references Sarah's paper and goes on to ask, uh, to comment that Sarah laid out competing, competing images, um, idioms of health justice, as we just noted, and the health and human rights idiom, she argues, is, quote, 
only one that puts the agency of the individual as a priority in terms of self-determination. Rights language is one of the um, one of is one of empowerment, giving a person a sense of competence and self-esteem through sharing knowledge, experience, and building solidarity. She then goes on to say, for human, for universal human health, for, excuse me, for universal health coverage to succeed, it should include bottom-up approach of educating and empowering community stakeholders. And so that's her argument. Okay. Um, so that's what Sarah offered, and we'd like to introduce now <laughs> Eric, um, who is a very, very impressive founding member of ACT UP, longtime social justice, HIV, human rights activist, and he is going to be leading the discussion today. So he's on the founding member board of the directors of the New York City AIDS Memorial and one of the longest term survivors of HIV AIDS and is well known throughout the world. Sure, why not? leading this, Eric. Sure, my pleasure. I'm a little disappointed that uh, we lost Zeke. I, <laughs> <laughs> I think he might have uh, <laughs> Uh, one, one of the people who um, had the most controversial presentation and might have uh, enlivened the discussion. I certainly had a few more questions for him than, than uh, what, what we asked there. I asked him one during the break, which I'll, I'll bring up in the brief re remarks that uh, I'm going to give. Um, so when it came time to you know write up or draw an outline on what I was going to say today, I struggled a bit. Um, I started multiple drafts. I called Scott and I, you know, I asked him, you know, to give me some guidance, you know, do you want me to summarize each of the presentations as a rapid tour? Do you want me to point out what points each presentation made that I thought were good or bad uh, or what questions they raised to me? And Scott punted the ball back to me. <laughs> And he said, well, you know, it's your time. Uh, use it as you like. <laughs> and so I thought, crap. <laughs> uh, and, and then I started thinking, you know, what am I going to add to these presentations? Which, you know, they're pretty, they're pretty good, right? Uh, and, and, you know, I agreed with a lot of what people said. So um, I basically, you know, started thinking, uh, you know, what am I going to really add to these arguments? Uh, and so um, I thought about like the varying arguments and uh, what I call false dichotomies, the false conflicts within some of them. Uh, you know, universal health care versus universal uh, coverage. Health as a human right or not in somebody's perspective. perspective. Um, you know, should health care be uh, at the highest attainable level or should it be a basic bottom threshold? And you know, I thought about you know ivory tower terms like uh, social medicine, social epidemiology, health equity, medical humanitarian humanitarianism, social justice, equitable resource allocation, cost effective resources, uh, solidarity. And I thought, you know, do I really want to talk about each of those things, um, or you, you know, what could I uniquely add to this discussion? And and you know what I think I can uh, add to this pers per to this discussion is uh, talking from the perspective uh, of a, a patient, talking from the perspective of a, a person living with HIV, uh, talking from an activist perspective, and talking about one of the people who were talking as one of the people who was on the front line of the development of the HIV response. And so uh, I'm going to go there. Uh, and and um, I thought that, uh, you know, maybe we should begin with like a look back um, at history of the HIV response. Uh, you know, what did we do to develop the HIV response? What did it teach us? Uh, and uh, I'm going to close with what Peter Piat once said to me uh, is the Eric Sawyer moment. 
and, and that's when I normally, uh, back in the early days of the epidemic, got up, threw a hissy fit, pounded on the table, and started yelling. Um, maybe I won't yell today. <laughs> but, but anyhow, um, and, and I'm sorry for those of you who were involved in the HIV response. Uh, you know, some of this may be uh, very familiar to, to you, but what did we have at the beginning of the HIV epidemic in, in the 80s? We had a new, fatal, horrible disease that killed all of uh, primarily healthy young men within a couple of, of years. And they were messy, uh, you know, horrifying deaths. Nobody knew the cause of, of the epidemic. Uh, nobody knew how it was spread. Nobody knew how to prevent it. Nobody knew how to treat us. Uh, and because of who it killed, junkies, queers, and whores, not that many people really cared. I mean, the government didn't care. Drug companies didn't care. They weren't developing uh, uh, any treatments or really doing any research. So effective communities had to respond. We had no treatments, so we fought for R&D. We fought for R&D uh, research budgets. We fought for R&D priorities. We, we decided we needed to revolutionize the drug approval process because in the US it took 10 to 15 years uh, to develop a treatment and we were dying in a year to two years of diagnosis. And so we fought to change the way that drugs uh, were approved. And once we started getting drugs uh, developed, we had to fight for mechanisms for poor people to pay for them. And so we fought for something called the AIDS Drug Assistance Program, which is a federally mandated and funded uh, uh, set of funds that will pay for HIV medications for poor people. Uh, because of uh, discrimination, uh, because of the fact that uh, people were being fired from their jobs, uh, people were getting too sick to work, we developed a real homeless <laughs> problem uh, in, in this country. Uh, but people with AIDS, like most of the safety net, couldn't qualify for housing vouchers because they weren't uh, disabled or uh, poor enough for a long enough period of time to, to reach the threshold at which a housing voucher or uh, a housing uh, supportive housing slot could be <laughs> made available to them. And so we had to fight for like expedited access to a housing placement. We had to fight for funding for uh, developing supportive housing. And, and we, we won something called the Housing Opportunities for People with AIDS Act, which actually gave us money to build medically appropriate housing. Um, uh, we also had issues with, with food security. I mean, there were lots of people that didn't have jobs, that were living on friends' couches, that didn't have a way to buy a meal. Uh, and so we fought for expedited access to uh, food stamps, and, and there were other uh, s supportive services, uh, treatment for substance use issues, mental health services, uh, uh, you know, support groups for, for depression. And, and so we fought for uh, what are now called you know, the social determinants of health uh, for those housing dollars for, for uh, uh, you know, supportive services for mental health, et cetera. And we won something called the Ryan White Care Act that, that paid for you know, a number of uh, those services. Uh, and so you know, we, were, we were fairly successful in, in coming up with uh, some responses uh, uh, some, some additional things to, to help people with AIDS uh, deal with their epidemic. How did, we, how did we win those things? Well, we basically won them by mounting a war. Uh, you know, and it really was a war. I mean, we were literally fighting for our lives. And we, we, we began by like building an army. And uh, you know, now we would talk about you know, creating a partnership of relative stakeholders <laughs> but but you know it, it really was building an army you know we, we we you know we basically you know reached out and 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 you know found partners in doctors and in lawyers and in nurses and in some researchers and and some social justice geeks uh, and um, we, we basically developed battle plans. You know, we, we basically had a bunch of foot soldiers, the activists, that basically their role was to go in and fuck things up. 
excuse my French, it, they, you know, they created chaos. They, they basically wanted to say that's not going to be, you know, business as usual anymore. We're going to disrupt your, uh, you know, governmental meetings. We're going to take over drug company offices. Uh, we're going to disrupt speeches by presidents and vice presidents and, and secretary generals uh, until we get people's attention, until we get people uh, to uh, want to do something to address the epidemic, even if it was just to shut us up. Uh, we also, uh, you know, developed our army of suits. You know, that was the polite lawyers, the doctors, the public health uh, individuals who, after we'd gone in and screwed things up and, and made a lot of people angry, we could send them in with detailed plans that, you know, outlay, outlined all of the problems that we were facing, that brought forward some uh, possible solutions and some systemic changes uh, that might actually uh, address the problems. ACT UP is fairly well known for having revolutionized the drug approval process here in the US and taking it from 10 to 15 years to develop a new drug uh, to, to you know, somewhere between three and, and five years to de develop a new drug. You know, we came up with plans that actually told how that could be done. Uh, and and uh, you know, people listened to us. Uh, we also like filed lawsuits. We worked with, uh, you know, we we developed congress. We we uh, one example of a lawsuit is in New York City and state. We sued for medically appropriate housing, because the 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 brilliancy of the New York City and state government was that they were going to develop uh, shelters for people with HIV. Uh, and TB and co-locate them because, uh, you know, those poor TB people and those poor people with AIDS, they're so tired and, you know, our shelter system throws everybody out at eight o'clock and they can't come back till five. And, you know, those, those you know, weak TB people and HIV people, we ought to let them like stay most of the day. And, you know, they're all so skinny. Let's give them extra bologna sandwiches. <laughs> So their, you know, their wisdom was going to create literally a TB incubator that would ensure that everybody with HIV uh, would get TB. And so uh, we threw a fit about that uh, and, and mounted a class action lawsuit that said that the, the city and state of New York needed to develop medically appropriate housing. It was a suit we actually won quite quickly. Um, but... Um, uh, I'm losing my train of thought here for a second. Oh, so, and, and in addition to that, and, and that class action uh, lawsuit ensured that uh, everybody who was homeless uh, and uh, had HIV had to, within 48 hours of uh, appearing for a housing placement, be given medically appropriate housing. Um, we also developed uh, a lot of PR strategies, uh, had a lot of PR stunts uh, where as an example, on the housing front, uh, we collected a lot of old furniture uh, uh, and to try to get some capital funds to develop supportive housing, we set up uh, T or we set up HIV housing in the streets uh, in front of a city office that provided housing for uh, poor people. We we chained ourselves to the furniture that we collected and dumped there uh, in pickup trucks and and uh, a van that I had. Uh, so the pickup truck and the van were parked at opposite ends of the block in front of HPD. Uh, you know, we were chained to furniture on on the um, on the uh, furniture that we we set up, and so the uh, and and we did this at five o'clock at the beginning of the evening news cycle, the local, the national uh, uh, news, and the city had to you know. Uh, bring in people with chain cutters to cut us off the, the couches. Uh, they had to bring in tow trucks to tow the vehicles away uh, and arrest us. So it took quite a while and it kept us on the news uh, all night. But it actually uh, succeeded in, in winning a $25 million capital from, from both the, the city of New York and, and New York State. Um, but, uh, you know, these are just some of the, the, the battles that... Uh, uh, we created, uh, that we waged. Um, and, you know, we were, we were fairly successful because 
uh, you know, we did collect an army of people. We, we got a lot of researchers, clergy members, writers, celebrities uh, to join our fight. Uh, and, you know, after we developed somewhat of an effective system here in, in the U.S., we started to turn our uh, view overseas and, and to the South. And that we saw that, you know, people with AIDS in the developing world uh, were still dying because they had access to none of the treatments, none of the social determinants uh, that we had here. And, um, you know, we didn't think that that uh, was fair. Um, uh, and so, you know, we joined hands with a number of public health geeks like Jonathan Mann. We um, uh, linked up with some health economists and, and trade experts like the Consumer Project on Technology, uh, led by Jamie Love, which is now called uh, Knowledge Environment Information. Uh, they, they did a lot of work to fight for the TRIPS Accord and the Doha Agreement and the ability to um, to develop generic drugs. We uh, joined hands with uh, humanitarian health care providers like Partners in Health and, and MSW. I'm sorry, uh, Medicine Sans Frontier. Uh, we joined with social justice uh, folks like Health Action International and um, uh, Oxfam. Uh, and we started to meet with a coalition to figure out what part of this war to get HIV treatments in the developing ro uh, uh, world each of us could do. Uh, and, you know, the activists had our role, go in and like screw things up, create a lot of chaos and, and make people uncomfortable. Uh, people like Partners in Health and Medicine Frontier said, you know, we can prove that uh, AIDS care can be delivered in resource uh, poor settings. And, uh, you know, in Conj, uh, Partners in Health showed that, you know, their patients, if they could get them antiretroviral drugs, had even better health outcomes than we had here in, in, in the U.S. Uh, they've done that also with TB uh, in, in a number of, of locations. Uh, the, the health economists and the intellectual property people, yeah, uh, like Jamie Love, did, uh, you know, work really hard to get... Um, the Doha Agreement, the TRIPS Accord, uh, and other things uh, developed, then um, promoted, and then developed uh, educational programs to teach people around the world uh, how um, those interventions could be used to try to uh, trigger uh, generic production uh, or generic importation of drugs through, through uh, parallel importing uh, 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 schemes. Um, and then, then there were people like um, uh, CIPLA, the, the generic drug production company um, in uh, India, um, and um, Jamie Love and, and some, some people uh, like uh, part, from Partners and Health and MSF started uh, going there and saying, you know, what is the lowest amount that you can produce HIV treatments for? Uh, and you know, initially, uh, I'm going to say his name wrong. Just just Sif Hamed, um, the, the the head of Simpla, said, "Oh, you know, well, I can probably do it for maybe two fifty, three hundred. And and everyone was like, "That's not enough. That you know, that's still going to be, uh, you know, a level where um, uh, you know people are going to think." that that's too much money. Uh, I, actually, I, I just misspoke. Initially, uh, he was saying around five to $600. And so, um, you know, what people said to him was, is there a way you could provide these drugs uh, for a uh, dollar a day? So that brings the price down to, you know, 365, 350. Uh, and he bought, he bought on it. And so he came forward and said, you know, I can produce these drugs for $350 per patient for year, per year. That, that kind of brought the price of drugs down to a level where uh, it was impossible for governments uh, to say uh, that um, it was not cost effective uh, to save a life for a dollar a day. And so that that you know basically 
you know, allowed us to move forward. Um, the, you know, when you turn this to the universal health care uh, uh, debate, and I, I shouldn't have gone into all that detail about the HIV crisis, um, I think we have a lot of agreement um, uh, in the room. Um, you know, is there really anyone in this room that doesn't think uh, health should be a human right? I mean, is there anybody here that believes that everybody should? <laughs> well, Zeke left. <laughs> Zeke left. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe there is. I mean, is there, is there anybody uh, here that, that doesn't believe that everyone uh, should have access to clean water, to basic sanitation, to clean air? Uh, you know, is, is there anybody um, here that's, you know, actually willing to say, I'm okay with denying someone access to clean air or housing or, or, or health? I don't think so. Um, and so, you know, I think we need to like quit arguing about what should be included in, 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 in uh, universal health care. I think we all know that, you know, we should include everything we can afford to give people. And yeah, you know, maybe, you know, maybe we can't afford to give everyone a $100,000 cancer treatment, but you know, can't we can't we afford to give everybody as much, or, or, or can't we agree to fight to give everyone uh, access to everything that we can possibly raise the money to get to get for them? And you know, isn't it time we start developing the the war plan? You know, we've got the army. You know, we've got people from all disciplines that you know want to see universal health care, and we have some governments. Uh, that are willing to do something. You know, we have a really weak declaration from the high-level meeting on on uh, UHC uh, this fall. Um, you know, we need better agreements that have targets and and call for funding amounts. But um, you know, let's stop the academic arguments and start fighting. That's all I got. Yeah. Well, Eric, you've raised your 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 intervention here has raised some really important points. You've talked about a disease that people didn't want to treat for which there wasn't drugs. Then when the drugs were made, they were too expensive. You talked about how using the human rights frame and civil society brought the price of the drugs down and helped push the creation of a delivery mechanism. So my question isn't for you, it's for Ole. I was really struck, I, I was, uh, there was an element of your talk that disturbed me, and it wasn't the human rights part. It was just the priority setting part. In one specific slide, you said, I don't think that we should uh, deal with the, I think you, you said something to the effect of that, I don't think we should deal with medium and, and low priority issues till all the high priority ones are dealt with. <coughs> and it immediately made, made me think of our own environment here in Boston, where if somebody wants an open heart transplant tomorrow, you can have it, tomorrow morning. But we still have high maternal mortality in some communities. If you drive to Lynn by the airport where you just landed, we have one of the highest TB rates in the United States. The United States has the highest maternal mortality in the OECD. So does that mean we should stop doing that? We should stop doing any high-tech care here in this country till we deal with that? Should Canada stop doing it? Their native Indians have a TB rate of 200 per 100,000. The general population, two per 100,000. Denmark, very high TB in Greenland, which they were not that eager to sell to the US a few months ago. Um, but yet the rest of Denmark doesn't have it. So should they stop high tech care? You know, so it just struck me as, uh, I was disturbed by it for, on a couple of levels. One is, these things have to happen simultaneously, was my sense, that you know that, yeah, you wanna build a high tech capability, some people need to use hospitals, as we've heard, some people need primary health care. so you need to build things at different levels so that, that you know, there, that, some, that you can have access, that expertise is built, that it, it, you know, it does exist. And so the, you know, the problem that I have, and in hearing Eric's story, I think it just nails it, is that if we all believe in human rights, that's great. But what does it mean if we have different ideas of prioritization? And if we're willing to accept progressive realization, not for ourselves, but on behalf of others who are not in our countries. 
And our countries are our countries, the United States and Canada and Denmark and wherever, because we've created borders in the post-colonial period, right? <laughs> like that's a, it's just a construct. So after 500 years of X, Y, and Z, we said, well, here's a border. So you can't come anymore, but we'll help you do your thing there and we'll help you prioritize. And so anyway, I found that, I think t to me, I was concerned, I, I was less concerned with what Zeke said and more concerned with that framing uh, in the WHO report. Okay, so uh, let me first start by thanking you for providing these stories. I, I remember um, one BBC documentary that really made an impression on me was Zaki Ahmad and the treatment impact uh, um, uh, campaign. And when he said that he would not take AIDS treatment before everyone in his country had the same access to these services. So in that sense, the, the HIV activists have has been a really inspiration for a lot of people. But I think there are, and I worked as a physician in Ethiopia, I see there are people suffering everywhere. And I think the ethical issue is, in your circumstances, as a decision maker, how do you balance the burdens and benefits between everyone who has a legitimate claim on your scarce resources? So my response to you would be that if Ethiopia, I was talking about low-income countries when I talked about the principles. I've led a national commission on priority setting in Norway. We have exactly the same issues. We have to say no to a few types of very expensive cancer drugs because we want to serve people with mental health, other things. There are resource constraints in every country. And if you have a situation like in Ethiopia with resource scarcity, the first unfairness is that they don't have more resources. So if you Americans have given as much uh, aid uh, as it was argued earlier, 0, 0.0 of GDP, for instance, or whatever, so if there was global solidarity, global justice, more resources in Ethiopia, of course you should provide all effective services, or at least as much as we could afford. But when these resources haven't been distributed like that, so how should the government of Ethiopia choose? And then Zeke's argument, my argument, is that then you have to set priorities in a way that is fair. And that means, in my opinion, until you have enough resources, you have to do what is most important, treating those who need it the most. So that, in my example, would be treat everyone that needs antibiotics for very simple infections, provide uh, vaccines, things that we know have a huge impact on population health. You cannot do that at the same time as you give open heart surgery in Ethiopia. That would take your resources away from what it could help more people who need it more. So that is the, in my view, the ethical dilemma. And I think a lot of you will disagree with me, but I still insist that that is the ethical dilemma. And the only way to get it out, out of that uh, uh, situation is to be an activist, to argue as strongly as you did for HIV AIDS, for all those kids who are dying unnecessarily for no access to antibiotics. Let me just jump in with a follow-up question. Um, you, you, know, you know, this issue of drug pricing is, is you know, one of the most difficult ones in, in you know, all healthcare, not, not, not only universal healthcare. Um, and, and I'll use the uh, hepatitis B, uh, C cure a, as an example. Uh, you know, the, the, the drug companies, the first one that came out in the U.S. was Gilead. They were charging about $1,000 a day for that three-month uh, treatment to cure hep C, uh, which, which could allow us, if we got everybody with hep C treatment, you know, we could eradicate uh, hep C. Well, as time went on, we found out that 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 drug could be developed generically uh, uh, for around a dollar a day. So that treatment that they were, you know, charging uh, 80, 90,000 dollars for getting it out of the realm of affordability, you know, really, it, you know, is it, the cost of production is around, around $90. And, and so why do we just go and, uh, you know, say, oh, well, we can't afford that treatment. Look what they're charging for it. And instead look at, you know, what does it really cost to provide that 
that care, you know? And how do we like shift the paradigm between, you know, paying for research and development uh, and rewarding innovation and, 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 you know, creating monopolies on, on production of uh, commodities and their distribution? And in, instead of just saying, oh, we can't afford it, say, well, wait a minute, you know, should it really cost this? And, and you know, what changes can we make to make that affordable to everybody? So if in a cost-benefit analysis, the cost is considered fixed by the journal. Just adding to that, to say that if one begins with many times public health people say, look, it's obvious we have to do cost benefit and we should do the thing that has the largest benefit, but assume that the cost is fixed as opposed to what the HIV treatment showed, what tuberculosis treatment that, um, that PIH was involved showed, is that the cost isn't fixed. The cost may be fixed at a moment, but that can be changed dramatically, and there are a whole series of things that affect that. And so that just by beginning, by saying, well, obviously, we can't treat HIV because it's too costly, as opposed to saying this isn't a fixed cost, is that was, was one of the problems that public health began with. And this, so this whole notion of, of beginning with cost-benefit analysis is starting with a very with a with with a real problem and and that is the basis for rationing i mean it's also problematic because you're also starting with the assumption that you have a, a set budget and what your stories tell us is that when you started there was nothing right zero and then by the time you're finished you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that are poured into it shape the battle to expand the pie, not just to accept the assumption that the pie is like health to demand. Um, yeah, thanks. I, I can I just add to this discussion because I worked in public health in Britain, and exactly what um, Ole has described is is normal public health practice in Britain that there's a that the, the, the public health departments of the different areas have to work out what they're willing to pay for in their particular health authority. Um, and so it's, it's done as far as possible on a cost effectiveness basis using NICE, which is the National Institute of Clinical Effectiveness. Um, the challenge is that it's almost the reverse of what um, has been described because what happened with one of the breast cancer drugs was that it was the pharmaceutical company that then came in and funded women with breast cancer to put on pink t-shirts and demonstrate in the streets, learning from the HIV activists to say, we demand to have this drug as a right. And directors of public health were saying, if we fund this drug, which actually has limited effectiveness at that point, um, and, and one of the principles was that it shouldn't, uh, you know, people were saying, I want to see my grandchild's first birthday, that kind of thing. Um, it shouldn't be something that only benefits somebody for, say, six months or three months. They were showing on an economic basis that funding this drug for a, a limited number of women would clean out their health budget. And they were saying the opportunity cost is we won't be able to fund adolescent mental health. We won't be able to fund neonatal care for women, uh, for babies that are born premature. They were saying these are the things we will not be able to fund. But the emotive issue of having women on TV saying, I demand this drug as my human right, meant that in the end, people had to give in and there wasn't extra money put into the system. So other things had to be sacrificed and it's usually the people who don't have the same power like adolescent mental health is a total cinderella area so it's a really difficult problem but i i still feel better um, about a system in britain which says we're going to try and treat everybody equally rather than that some people who have money or have a better health insurance 
because I think private practice is still only about 10 or 11 percent, that they will have access from the public purse and will sacrifice people on the other side, which I think is what the prior the whole priority setting agenda. Yes, exactly. No, but the, but he's just shown that the with level ni of that Nice could have told that company just don't do you see what they had to do? No, but do you see what they had to do in order to get the drug companies to take them seriously? Act Up was in every conference, throwing red paint at at, at stands, etc. Uh, and and to some extent, it made HIV exceptional. It doesn't happen. Nobody is demonstrating to make sure that that girls have HPV vaccination. Nobody is demonstrating to make sure that elderly people have access to dementia care. You know, so this is the problem, and this is why it needs activism, and why people should be supporting civil society. Because most of the time, drug companies are being subsidized by governments. I have a question that I was going to ask of Ola, but I'm going to ask it of Sarah. Um, the, <laughs> the, uh, the, there's an amazing moment. One of the most amazing things that I've found in doing primary historical research um, is a transcript of the board meeting of the World Bank three months before investing in health, um, the World Development Report, was released in 1993. And Nancy Birdsall and, um, and Dean Jameson, who wrote it, were there, and they were being grilled by the executive directors of the bank. <coughs> and, you know, much of it was very anodyne, but one um, of the, the EDs, Bimal uh, Jilan of India, um, had this incredible intervention that is, you know, much like the conversation that's happening now. So I, I was originally going to uh, to read it to Ola and, 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 and ask him to comment, but um, but he ends with what I think is one of the most profound questions that I could imagine in a in a board meeting of the World Bank. Um, so and and I think it's related to the to the research that you you shared with us today. Um, so, you know, he, he went through many of these questions. He said, you know, in India, there are a billion people who um, are likely to, you know, who, who are at high risk of dying of heart disease. And um, maybe, maybe I can't remember exactly um, how it was put. That sounds high as I, as, I, as I say it. But there are, you know, there are millions and millions of people who are at high risk uh, uh, of dying of heart disease. They make one dollar a day. And according to the cost-benefit analysis that was the uh, underpinning, the cornerstone of the World Development Report in 1993, a time when ACT UP was, you know, really just beginning to develop its intervention, um, uh, according to this cost-benefit analysis, they would have to die. And so Bimal Jalan looks Nancy Birdsall in the eye, looks Dean Jameson in the eye, and he says, can it be the principle of state policy that the poor should die of heart disease? And, you know, he goes on and expands on, on the question in this really beautiful way, and then he ends with the following, um, uh, the following point. He says, I think it's also essential when you put forward a report on a subject like health, which deals with life and death, that it is also important to perhaps have a little compassion and a little care for the disabled rather than send the message that these people who earn one dollar or less a day and for which we weep from day to day should not have any access to any services because they are cost effective. And so my question, Sarah, is, is about compassion and the role of compassion. And it, it, it was kind of a horrible moment as it turned out because what, uh, what, what Nancy Birdsall and Dean Jameson both said in succession was, well, yeah, we need to add the word compassion to the World Development Report. <laughs> and I, 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 I never went to look to see if they had actually <laughs> added the word compassion to the report, but you know, you can, you can make your own judgments. But, 
but, but what is, you know, compassion is a much older word than the words that you, um, you know, have studied in this particular train of thought. But w how does it function and what's its role in this broader discussion about rights? That's my question. Well, that's an extraordinary question, and I, I, in many ways, want to hear what others have to say on this point, but I think one very minor intervention I can make has to do precisely with the ways in which I think some of these idioms are effective by speaking beyond the technical, beyond the technocratic, beyond the professional, by speaking to personal experience, by connecting with, you know, humanity. And some of these idioms do that, and some of them do it well, and some of them don't. And some of them aren't meant to, right? They're meant to travel only in certain circumstances, and they're meant to sanitize suffering and, and complexity, or at very least to bureaucratize problems such that the solutions are going to be offered in one register when in fact the suffering is happening in a very different in di very different spaces among very different people so I, I think um, the fact that it hasn't emerged compassion um, it, you know it sort of figures in different places and conversations is itself interesting and I, I I think I would love to hear what others have to say perhaps Ole perhaps Eric and others can I or maybe Who's, 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 okay. who's deciding? Okay. <laughs> so, so quickly, I, th I think compassion is extremely important, uh, and we are moved by compassion. But in my view, the healthcare system is a social institution within countries. And we have, as, as a community, we have to decide on how should that institution respond to suffering among all the people in the population. And we can discuss what should be the key principles that we build our system on. We did that in Ethiopia. We asked people, we had a deliberative process, they said we want to start with burden of disease, then continue with cost effectiveness, equity, um, budget impact, social acceptability, and political acceptability. We can disagree with these principles, but I think there should be a deliberative process uh, where people decide on how should we share these resources that we have. And of course, compassion should be something, uh, but we cannot build social institutions only on compassion if we don't have the resources. That would be my response. Uh, just to add to that, compassion has been a huge part of discussions within the medical community about such things as patient-centered care, person-focused care, transforming the way we care for patients, and these kinds of discussions are taking place globally. Compassion is also something that comes across in a huge way in literature, in writing, in narratives, in memoirs, because there's tremendous frustration on the part of patients, families, caregivers, other concerned individuals, that it's not enough part of these conversations. There's the acknowledgement, of course, that without the resources Sources, you know, all the compassion in the world isn't going to save as many people as we want. But the flip side of that is without compassion, we're losing a lot of lives and we're increasing a lot of suffering even in the presence of a lot of resources. And that comes across in literature really, really clearly because it doesn't come across in the, in the broader uh, global health debates as it might. Um, so I would respond by saying, uh, tell me more about that story. What is it, w what's the basis for saying that all those people who are living on $1 a day are going to die of cardiac disease, okay? No, 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 um, I'd say let's do that, okay? Let's unpick it. Because in some ways that takes us to the social determinants. The biggest killer in many countries, and uh, uh, India and China together have the biggest population, so they're always going to have the largest number of everything. Um, in, in Africa, remember that 15, uh, people under the age of 15 are still 41% of the population. So until the demographics change, the whole NCD thing is, is not going to be more than the communicable diseases. But the biggest killer is going to be sugar and salt. Now, it's not doctors who have to take that out of people's diets. Where's the responsibility of that? in the food manufacturers. The fact that a, a can of Coke uh, has 10 spoons of sugar covering up the taste of the salt, and the salt is in there for, to make people thirsty so they drink more Coke. 
So it's part of, you know, the same thing about the drug companies, challenging the drug companies to say, why is your drug costing so much, which we must do all the time. Um, and, and is it reasonable that we pay all this R&D? And people have written about the challenges of the pharmaceutical company. The same thing applies to the food industry. The same thing applies when you start unpicking social determinants. The same thing applies to occupational health. You know, it's when you start saying, why are people at risk of illness, infectious or, or, or non-infectious, and saying, what can we do to change that, which is a public health function? Then we have to start addressing those things. But challenging people to say, okay, we've got to address heart disease, when we should be preventing it. But how do we prevent it? We have to have activism against the causes of, of illness. The fact that ACT UP was able to campaign for housing. Can you imagine if we tried to do that in, in most urban areas of Africa, where, every, where most people, the majority of people live in crap housing? There are hostels which house 20 people in rooms that were meant to have one person. You can't start saying because of HIV, you've got to have better housing. We've got to campaign for everyone who's in that situation. And that's when you begin to talk about social justice and, and, how, and it becomes really hard. But you know, that's, that's the challenge. That's what we have to be doing. You know, 25% of children are stunted. They're not dying, but they're growing up stunted, you know, which has all kinds of implications. So what do we do about that? Some of it, as Vikram teaches, is about maternal depression. Why maternal depression? If you were living in a room with 20 other people and you didn't know where your next meal was coming from, maybe having to sell sex to pay the school fees, we'd all be depressed. But that's the reality that a lot of people are living in. And then you have to come down to the fact that the US is responsible for a huge amount of the inequality in the world. Even the climate change issue. We sat in Zimbabwe, we couldn't do a damn thing about Cyclone Idai, okay? Because we don't use all the energy that is causing the change in the climate. So you guys need to be campaigning here in the US of A to get people to become more environmentally conscious so that we aren't affected by it in the South. Because we can't go marching to tell people to stop having air conditioning. We don't use air conditioning. So this is, this is the challenge, you know. ACT UP was able to do it for one disease. We're, we've got to do the same thing for all of this. Because that's the basis of inequality. It's not doctors or primary health care or any of those things. It's the whole way that our economies are structured. Sorry, I jumped in. just said in far more uh, poignant terms uh, a, an angle that I wanted to raise, and that is this afternoon we've heard a great deal about struggles over language, over priority setting, over use of resources, but always focused in our narrow uh, health world. Why are we not talking about military spending, for example? And if we want to look to uh, a setting that has done uh, an incredible job at actually using social and political struggle as an approach to improving well-being, not just health, Look at Costa Rica that eliminated its military following a very brutal civil war in the mid-1940s and notwithstanding, you know, according to World Bank uh, country categories, a, for many, many years, a low-income country was able to marshal power in a very, you could call it a democratizing sense, in a socializing sense, and so it strikes me that we need to transcend our technocratic bubble and go uh, 
as, as Sunanda and several others have suggested, far beyond this question. And I, I completely disagree with the discourse of scarce resources. I think that's a wrong way to approach the challenges that we're faced with now. It's a reorientation of resources. It's a, an issue uh, not just of redistribution of, of, of money, but redistribution of power across societies. And if we don't start addressing that, and, and as academics and uh, folks who are working in technical fields, seeing ourselves as the uh, those in solidarity with uh, or those uh, serving in many ways the social movements, I think we'll just end up in these circular conversations for the next generations. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, I think I'm... Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I am uh, more towards going to go back to the technocratic uh, uh, opinion, pri primarily because all of our health systems have implicit rationing. If we do not make our rationing systems uh, more explicit, more transparent, more accountable, more community participatory, as Ole has uh, talked about in his system, we are going to end up I, even with a... Uh, uh, countries that make that put together or declare they will have, for example, health benefit packages that are unaffordable. Uh, and so th what will happen will be an implicit rationing system that will end up being uh, in uh, yeah, the cities, uh, those who are, who are uh, best able to use the system to make uh, to uh, access those resources. I grant you that, uh, and I, I commend organizations like uh, uh, Partners in Health and Paul Farmer, who have really uh, uh, acted very strongly to try to increase the number of resources available. But I feel also that uh, we have to live within the resources available and then just and make our rationing systems based on, a, uh, on systems that are accountable and systems that are uh, more uh, available and known to all those such as that was described by Ole. Thank you. Um, if you want to see the, the film of Eric's amazing talk, and I'm sure a, a number of you have seen this, but the, the film Fire in the Blood, I, mean, I, I bet you're starring it, don't you, uh, Eric? The, the, uh, which is an absolutely fantastic documentary made of the, of the battle to win the rights to uh, HIV medicines, particularly in, in Southern Africa, mentioning all the people you, you, you discussed there. So very much recommend that that people uh, should 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 see that and perhaps one good example as well just this week uh, from the uk of, of the cystic fibrosis uh, drug now being accepted and perhaps you know the, there is some role for both in in terms of that it was nice that that sort of sets the the, sort of the the levels at which the nhs will buy medicines for the entire population and you know that the basis of the nhs is either everyone gets it or no one gets it and you know this is really, really tough. And and a pharmaceutical company came in was going to sell this medicine for I think a hundred thousand dollars or pounds or something, and the UK said no, that is outrageous. That sort of gangster style financing, you know, sort of we're not going to pay that. But then the campaign was building up to. to demand this medicine and now a deal has been struck this week i think it's a confidential deal you know that but the nhs buying on behalf of selling 70 million people has, have now agreed to this so i think that is a good example of you know how these two worlds can sort of work together but i think you know it really does raise this question about pharmaceutical pricing and and sort of allowing uh, pharmaceutical companies to to do this and I, and I think really questions whether the whole research and development should be left in the private sector and i think more and more is an argument that one should nationalize a lot of pharmaceutical research there's actually a couple of bills that have been in congress for probably a decade at this point one's called an r d treaty that basically is calling for governments with with resources to create a R&D fund based on G, a percentage of GDP that would fund all, all research. And that once, uh, once new drugs are developed uh, that they don't go to patent, that they're given uh, like a Nobel Peace Prize, you know, an innovation prize of, you know, however many billion dollars 
uh, uh, is established uh, with the understanding that that drug then goes, you know, uh, into the public market, that everybody can produce it generically, that everybody has access to it. Uh, and that's the kind of like paradigm shift that I think we need uh, to, you know, to, to, you know, scrap the patent system and, and get the profit motive out of access to essential drugs. I know we're out of time, don't have time to really take this issue on, but it's ironic that over and over again, in any discussion of, of, of uh, universal health coverage, it comes up universal health coverage, except for non yeah. And this is, uh, hold on, except for non-citizens. And this, at this moment, we go on as though we didn't just say that, is quite remarkable, and it's actually, inherent in national health insurance systems so that when Thailand formed their national health insurance, it was the first time that they began excluding people that were on the borders who had often lived there for generations but were not formally Thai citizens. And it happens over and over again. And in the city of Cambridge, it's much harder to provide health care now for persons who are undocumented than it was before there was a Massachusetts, you know, mass health system. And, and I, it, it seems to me this is just a, an, an issue that has to be taken on in any discussion of universal health coverage, always is universal health coverage, except non-citizens at this moment in history. Yeah, and it's particularly ironic in places like Japan, where the undocumented population is actually quite low compared to other regions, and where there's plenty of wealth to cover the end. So it's a matter of principle, it's not a matter of cause, yeah. If I could just, I, I know I've imposed this image um, in everyone's visual field, and I just want to say a quick word about it. Um, first, to note that the activist struggles that Eric was describing earlier are now cultural history, um, and they were part of the exhibition at the CDC Museum, and I think that that in itself is interesting and, and you know, inspiring in the sense that it's, um, there have been those within that federal institution who've made a choice to put a human rights frame into the conversation about ways in which um, action can be taken. Um, and, and just to sort of link up with this larger set of questions, um, in terms of solidarity, there, there are there are aspects of the conversation we're having that persist in, in you know, using an us-them divide. And I think that the most exciting moments in our conversation today are happening when we kind of find ways to, to talk about a we and an us and to recognize interconnectedness and to recognize humanity, to recognize the humanity of the different idioms put on the table when we hear about what the idiom of human rights, for instance, can offer to people who are feeling absolute desperation and looking for tools um, in terms of clinical training of um, individuals who are charged with supporting uh, people in resource poor settings and giving them a way to think about what they're entitled to and to think about the role of the caregiver. I, I just wanted to sort of take a moment to say this, this idea of idioms and this idea of human rights as an idiom and other idioms I think might offer some, um, some value for us as we think about what works and what doesn't and try to, to move a conversation forward. Um, thanks. Okay, so, I th I, so I think in the interest of time we should wrap up now and certainly if, if this morning's agenda was to, to frame these issues historically, today was to put critical ideas and intention. I think we certainly succeeded in that. So, so thank you, all, all, all our panelists, for, for, for the second panel today.